It's all unto the Lord. That's what it is. I mentioned in uh, the prayer that today is a, a message that might be one of the hardest passages in Scripture. We are in Exodus. We're waking our way through it pretty well. Uh, today we're going to be going through chapters 11 and 12. And the theme of the entire series is, are you seeing God in your journey? On your day-to-day life, is God manifesting Himself to you? Are you witnessing His work in your life and those around you? Do you see His glory in creation and the, just the little things that bring beauty into your soul and your life? Are you seeing Him in, in, your, in your sorrows? Is He present with you in your dark moments? Because the journey we have in this life is full of wonder and it's also full of brokenness. But God is not absent at all in either. He's there. So our goal is to see Him in this journey we call life. I've titled this message, uh, Differences Make a Difference, and you'll understand why as we go through the text. Uh, I heard on the radio, oh, maybe five, six months ago about a town, middle America, a tiny little town, I don't know how many people, less than 100, I imagine, Never had a stoplight or a stop sign. That, that's what we're talking about, a little one-road town. You just go through it, and that's the way it is. Well, some of the city leaders said, you know what? we got a lot of traffic coming through now. We should probably put in a stoplight, stop sign. And uh, they did so. And they had more accidents after the stop sign than they had beforehand. And the reason, because the locals had no clue that there's a stop sign. And the people who are coming through who are stopping, and then they look and they go both ways, boom, they're getting hit all the time. So sometimes you make a good decision, but people don't follow it, they don't get it, they don't understand it. Reminded of another story, I mean, I, I, there's somebody in this world that thinks poorly of me, and I, I, I don't know their name, I can barely remember their face, but they asked me for directions at a gas station, and I gave them the directions. And then after I drove away, I realized I missed a turn. (laughs) I don't know where they're at right now, if they're still alive, if they're on the side of the road someplace saying, who's that guy at Chevron? I don't know. Imagine yourself driving down the road. Maybe you're going to go see the Grand Canyon. And you stop by a little diner and you say, hey, is there a, is there a way to get to the Grand Canyon? I'm, I'm kind of lost. This is before GPS, y'all. So uh, that's good. And the guy gives you directions. Says, hey, you go this way and it's a beautiful place. You've got to see it. Everybody's got to see this. Just, just, just go and you're good to go. Just drive away. You'll see the place down the road. And so you drive along the road and your journey's going pretty well. And you're seeing some nice things, some good things. And and, uh, but then you start seeing on the side of the road, and this is maybe an hour in, people are on the side of the road and maybe they've run out of gas. There's potholes and chuck holes, and you see the suspension going up and down. You see people on the side of the road, and they're broken down, and their cars are overheating. And then you start getting afraid that you might run out of gas, that you might break down on this crazy road. Then you come to a backup, and the traffic is stopped. And every now and then you see a car coming back the other direction. And on the other side of the road, as you're inching through, you see other cars on the other side of the road that are, are shut down. Whether they're out of gas or broken down, you don't even know. And you go and you go, and finally you're at such a stop. You get out of your car and you're looking down the road, what is going on? And other people are out of their car. Finally you wave someone down, what is going on? And they say, there's no way through, there's a bridge out up here. This bridge has been gone maybe for 40 years. No one knows. And, I'm, and then you turn around and you make your way back. This guy in the diner has steered you wrong. You come back to the diner and say, hey, you gave me directions to the Grand Canyon. And he goes, well, yeah, you just take that road. Well, I took that road. No, not that road. It's that road. And you'll get there in 25 minutes. What? That diner guy did not tell you the whole story. He didn't give you the whole picture. He didn't make it clear as to which path you should be on and 
One was not going to get you there. It was never going to get you there. And if you take it, you're going to be in trouble. Only telling half of the story and not making the story clear is going to be trouble for everyone. In this world, we see a separation that the world wants part of the story. God is good. God is love. God is merciful. God is patient. God is not, going, is not condemning. God is not going to be judging. And I can do what I want to do. And they've only got half the story, and it's led them to the wrong conclusion. Yes, God's loving. He's patient. He's full of mercy, full of grace. And yet, there's a road to take. And there's a difference in the life that we live because of Him. I heard on the radio this morning coming in that uh, since 2018, 30% of evangelicals have left the church. And the reasons why they do this is They have a desire to remove from anything that smells of religiosity or religion. Now, you've heard me say a a lot of times, it's not about religion, it's about relationship. And that is true. But if I say, it's not about getting along, it's about marriage. Well, being married would call for you to get along, to treat each other right, to abide by the values that are in the home. And if you break those values, if you break those covenants, is it a marriage? There's another side of the story. They say that they want to hold to a spiritual walk. And many of them still say, there is a power outside of myself, and that's good. And yet they no longer believe that that power compels them to do certain things in a certain way, and they have left the idea that they should ever talk to anybody about changing their positions. See, somewhere along the the road, they left being people of the book and became people of their own making. They see a good loving God, but not a holy God. They can't deal with the term holiness because that gets in the way of self-determination. They want to do their own thing. One of the other things they said, that they said, and there's a book out there called Exvangelicals, is that they can't stand any longer the church's position on cultural matters and social issues that counter societal norms. And in each one of the things they bring about, the positions they hold are not in alignment with this book. So anyone that holds to this book is someone they deem as evil, wrong, judgmental, fundamental, uncaring, can I just suggest to you that evangelical is not a political term? Republicans don't have a monopoly on evangelicalism. Democrats do not have a monopoly on evangelicalism. If you're a person of the book then your party preference and your voting preference and your life preference is going to go along with the book, period. Might I suggest to you that evangelicalism is not American? The word itself is Greek. That America does not have a monopoly on Christianity. In fact, Christianity is not birthed in America. It's a Middle Eastern religion. Can I tell you that the Messiah you serve is not a white man? It's not a white religion. Being an evangelical is not white. It's not American. 
and it's not political. The Greek word is the bringer of good news. That's what being an evangelical is. Same root as evangelism, evangelist, bringing good news. That's why I am an evangelical, I'm not a Catholic or a mainline person. In many ways, they've kind of left the book. In some mainline religions, they've abandoned the authenticity or the authority of this book. Well, all bets are off at that point. You can believe anything you want to believe. But might I suggest to you that what is taking place in this book is fact, and the demons believe every word of this book. They know it to be true. They don't abide by it. And many people are leaving the faith, not abiding by it. That the God of the Word is no longer the God of the heart in their own minds. And they can do anything they want. See, what does the bringer of the good news mean? There are two sides of this. What is the good news? The good news is that you can be rescued from sin. That you can be rescued from death. The good news is you can have life in Christ, life in the Spirit, life everlasting, but life in Christ is not life in the world. Life in the Spirit is not life in the flesh. That's the other side of the story. And they have to go hand in hand. Prior to the crucifixion, there were thousands of people coming to hear Jesus teach. The Bible says there were 500 very close faithful followers. Many of them instigated what we'll be talking about next week in the triumphant entry of Jesus coming in on Palm Sunday and everybody singing Hosanna. The 500 were engaged with that. And as a result of it, the people around said, oh my goodness, this must be the Messiah coming in. Oh boy, and they're throwing down their coats and palm branches and saying, hey, the king has come, thinking that he would bring deliverance from Rome and earthly oppression. In fact, the Greeks, the non-Jews around are saying, we want to see him. Who is this guy? Show us who this Jesus is. It's really interesting that uh, within three days, there's only 12 individuals hanging out. And one of them was Judas Iscariot. Eleven. Well, where are the others? Fast forward to Acts chapter 2. How many were in the upper room? 120. Now, this is 120 faithful people in one accord. Well, where are the other 380? The 500 that have been walking with him, hearing him, staying with him, traveling with him everywhere. Where are the other 380? Where did they go? Why did they, they leave? And let me just say that I think that they left because the moment that Jesus declared who he was in that week between the triumphant entry and the time of Gethsemane and the cross, he proclaimed him self to be the Messiah, but not in the way they thought was going to happen. The Jewish leaders didn't get on board. He was not over uh, uh, riding Rome. He wasn't proclaiming some political shift. And everything they thought about Jesus didn't mess what they were expecting about Jesus. And they saw those who followed Jesus being persecuted put to death, slandered. A call to suffering along with Christ was not in their lexicon, and so they left. And how much like that are those who claim to be Christians but have left the body of Christ? They don't want to be in alignment with those who hold to truth. They don't want to be in alignment with those who might suffer for their faith, that don't 
mesh with the societal norms. The classic traditional Judaism said that the Messiah was going to be this, and they got it wrong because Jesus came to be peace to the heart, and his suffering and death was going to be paramount for victory over death and sin. But the people of God, who are close to God, were different. They leaned into Jesus. You alone have the words of eternal life. We'll walk together in one accord, seeking your face and praising your name. And the Holy Spirit will pour upon us and we'll be witnesses first to Jerusalem, then Judea, then Samaria, and then the entire world. The people of God were different. In chapter 11, and you can open your Bible there, we're going to go through verses within the next two chapters. We see that God is instructing Moses to speak to the people and for them to be prepared for the final plague that was going to come. And they need to be ready to leave at a moment's notice. In chapter 11, 7, it says, The Lord makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel. And we've forgotten that the Lord has made a difference calls us to be different. So let's identify the differences that I see in these texts that we're going to look at. The first one I see here is that uh, the, peop- the people who are favored and those who are not favored. Those who walk with Christ are walking in favor. Those who are not are not favored. In verse 3 of 11 it says, and the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. He says, hey, The Lord's going to bring another plague, but you're different. You're not going to be treated like the Egyptians. Now, long before this, the Lord had offered other plagues. And in each one of those, if you look back in the text, you'll see that although Egypt faced locusts and flies and all this other stuff, the people of Israel they didn't experience that. Darkness in the entire land, but not where the Israelites were. Famine in the entire land, but not where the Israelites were. They were protected because God favored them over Egypt. God wants you and I to experience His favor as well. Look at Psalm 90. It says, let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our hands, the things that we do. May His favor be upon us for all that we do. In chapter 5 of Psalms, it says, For you bless the righteous, O Lord. You cover him with favor as with a shield. God's favor is on those who follow Him. Christmas was not that long ago, and we go through it every year about the angels coming down and They're singing the praises of God. And remember what they said in Luke 2, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace. And it doesn't stop there. The whole earth, peace to the whole earth. No. On earth peace to those on whom His favor rests. Oh, I want to be favored by God. I want to be someone that God says, I got you. You're going to go through hard times, but I'm going to protect you. I'm going to be with you. You're favored. Let's be that. Moses instructs Pharaoh of this final plague. In fact, chapter 11 is the final warning. You got opportunity in that last moment. You've been rejecting God, rejecting God, rejecting God, rejecting what his word was. You got one more chance here. Pharaoh, of course, doesn't. Abide by it. He says, look, the firstborn of all the land's going to die. Not just you Egyptians, but all of your slaves. The firstborn's going to die. Not just the people, the cattle, everything. The firstborn is going to die. And there's going to be a huge cry, and you can imagine. And here's the word of the Lord. He says, but the dogs won't even growl at the people of Israel. And he's really saying, you won't even have to say, and these dogs are dealing with 
not literal dogs. But the people of Israel will not even cast blame on the Israelites for what's going to come. They're going to blame themselves, and they're going to blame Pharaoh, and they're going to blame their own adjustment and wanting to hold on to their way in idolatry and not follow God's Word. He says, hey, when this happens, then they'll let you leave. Israel's been a slave for 430 years. And here's what the Lord says. What does He want? Let my people go. Let my people go. I want my people not to be in bondage. I do not want my people to be in slavery. My people are not called to be bound as slaves to anything but to worship and serve me. And my favor is upon them. Look, at this moment in time, the land is in waste. Nine plagues have come. There's no crops. There's no cattle. It's brutal. These people are begging for a piece of bread, and there's no grain to make it. And they are yelling at Pharaoh, come on, what are you holding off for? Let them go. Let them go. Please let them go. And Pharaoh says, no, I'm not going to do it. And that gets us to the, the second point. The first one is, look, God's got a favor for His people that's not on those who are not on His people, who are not His people. The second difference is a soft heart versus a hard heart. Pharaoh had a hard heart. And outside of time and space and eternity, God looked down in the timeline and says, Pharaoh's not going to turn. I know he's not going to turn, so I'm going to use him. He's determined in his life, and I see his life, I see his birth, and I see his death. I know the choices he'll make. I know he's hard. I'm going to magnify that hardness. He's not going to turn. We looked at that last week, I think. Verse 10 of 11 says, And Moses and Aaron did all these wonders before Pharaoh. The Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he did not let the people go out of his hand. And we dealt with the idea that God will allow you to do anything and everything you want to do, and if you continue to choose and be hardened, 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 he'll say, okay, you go ahead. I'm letting you go. And you bear the consequences because I'm, I'm letting you do that. My covering is off. Chapter 12, 27, this is the distinction between Pharaoh's heart that's hard and the people. It says the people bowed their hearts and their heads and they worshiped. See, I think the thought of God should melt our hearts. But for some, the devil has his way in them, and they they view God differently. They actually allow their heart to be hardened along the way. He says, God didn't do this for me. He didn't do that for me. He wasn't there for me then. Well, were you there for him? Was your heart there? What was the road ahead? You see, they had nine opportunities God's so patient, He gives you ample choices, ample time to make that choice to serve Him, to follow Him. If you don't, you don't. Imagine a frozen river with clay banks. And when the sun comes out like it's done in the last couple of days, the same sun that melts that ice hardens the clay. There is a difference. The difference is how you handle your heart. Stiff arming God or welcoming Him. The people listened. Pharaoh didn't. Psalm 51 asks the Lord to create in me a clean heart, a new heart. The Scriptures say that His laws are written on our hearts that we know what is right and what is wrong. Ezekiel says, and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you and I'll remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh softened before the Lord. That's a difference. Those who have left, those who have abandoned, those who have become apostates, they're out there. And they've walked away from God, and their heart is hard toward the things of God. 
the truths of God. No, I won't believe that. No, I will not live by that. No, I will not embrace or be a friend of anybody who holds to that. My heart is hard. Okay. But God is offering a softer heart. Jeremiah echoes this. He says, I'll give them a heart to know that I am the Lord, and they shall be my people. I'll be their God, for they shall return to me with their whole heart. There's a difference. There's a difference between the hardened and the softened. There is a difference between the people of God and the people who pretend to be people of God and those who completely curse God. There's a difference between the family of God and the difference in the way we live. Philippians says, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and guard your minds in Christ Jesus. This peace that we have with God, this relationship of peace, that we're no longer enemies, but we're in a relationship, it'll check us. It'll say, no, that's not for you, kid. That road is a dangerous one. You need to watch out for that. That's what the peace of God offers, that our hearts and our minds would be guarded. The third difference, I take a look at this, and this is really where we get to it, and I'm amazed by the text here. It's fascinating to me is the difference between death or deliverance. There's one plague to go. Folks, it's a, it, it's a bad one. You might be able to give up a paycheck here and there. You might have the cupboard a little bit dry every now and then. You might even lose a job here and there. But when you take my kid, hey, haven't you crossed the line, God? Go ahead, change the Nile. Go ahead, bring us lice and locusts. Who cares? Kill my cattle, big deal. Walk in darkness, no big deal. I'm, a, I'm, I'm prone to darkness anyway, God. But touch my kid. What has God got to do to get your attention? Verse 29 says, at midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon and all the firstborn of the livestock. We see this event as a major event in the book of Exodus, a major event in Christendom. But do you realize it's only a, a handful of verses? If you look at the text, it's only giving you three verses of the actual event. We've got what, multiple chapters, 40, 50 chapters in Exodus. Three verses. God gives us a plan of salvation in this text, and we'll look at that in a minute. But I'm amazed there's just three verses that talk about the actual event of this plague. Verse 23, it says, The Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians, and when he sees the blood on the lintel and the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to enter your houses to strike you. You may know the story, you may not, but they were told to take a lamb and kill that lamb large enough only for the household, and take the blood and put it on the, the mantle and the doorposts. And when the angel of death was going to pass over, if he saw the blood on the door of your home, you were safe. And if it wasn't there, this cross of blood on the door, then death The New Testament says we are all under the love of God or the wrath of God. That we are saved or we are lost. There's no gray area. You're redeemed or you're doomed. 
this death angel was going to pass over every single household, from the smallest hut to the greatest of palaces, from the poorest of the poor to the richest among them. Highly educated and uneducated. No one was going to get away from this moment. Hebrews 9 says, It's appointed unto man once to die, and after that will come judgment. None of us are getting out of this alive. For every person who is born, there's an equal number of people who die. If you're born, you will die. What are the two most uh, things you can count on? Death and taxes. You're not getting away from it. The death rate is still one per person. The Bible says the Lord put a difference between the Egyptians and the Israelites. What was the difference? You tell me, what is the difference? Well, there's protection. The difference is if you have obeyed the Lord and your door is covered in the blood of an innocent lamb, then you are protected. Now, why were some of the, why were these people spared? Let me tell you, the difference is not that they were better people. Did you hear me? They were not protected because they were good people. They had some real issues. They gave grief to Moses all along the way. We'll see that. They decided to go ahead and build a golden calf and worship it about halfway through. While the law of God, the presence of God is right in their midst and the mountain is just woo, and the glory of God's coming down on Moses and his covenant is being revealed, they're uh, they're melting their gold and making a golden calf. These are troubled people. Sexual sins, prevalent maybe. They ran out of food, they cursed God. They ran out of water, they cursed God. Their morality did not make them different. Well, you say, I know. Well, the priests did the ceremonial things and they performed the rituals to bring them salvation. Let me tell you this. Even God said their rituals were empty and repetitive. He wanted their heart. And that's kind of why we have so many problems with Christians in the church today. We've got a lot of spiritual drowsiness. We don't see the difference anymore. Equal amount of divorces, equal amount of depression issues, medication issues, suicidal issues, broken family issues. What's the difference? Sometimes we don't see where the world begins and the church ends. We can't tell a gospel song from a secular song. We can't determine sometimes when we see where worship and entertainment takes place on a stage. Don't know the difference between a saint and a sinner anymore. It's something else to watch. What's the difference? The difference is the blood of the Lamb. It's always been the blood of the Lamb. It's the theme of the entire Bible. It's why we look at the Old Testament, because every single thing in the Old Testament is a shadow of what's to come in this messianic fulfillment of Jesus who completed it all on the cross. It is finished. The mantle, the doors, was a symbol of a cross, of an innocent blood. The text here says that there's a lamb for every family. They had to get a lamb that was just large enough that they could consume it in one night. Verse 3 says, tell the congregation of Israel, 
that on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's house, a lamb for the household. Now, later on in Leviticus, we see the priest taking a lamb for the whole nation, but right here, when it comes to what's going to happen, whether you're saved or you're dead, whether you're delivered or you're dead, it's personal. No pastor can do this for you. No priest can cover you. It's personal. Is the door of your heart covered with the sacrificial blood of Christ? God's very particular here. There's more verses about how particular they were supposed to go than the actual event itself. Ten days of preparation. What they're supposed to do and go out and get funds and this and that. And and everything was so meticulous because there is a way to salvation. And God alone will tell you the way and you can't rewrite the script. John 1 says, the next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. John is looking at this, his cousin Jesus, and he knows even from before he was born, he leaped in his mother's womb. He knew who this was, and he says, there's the Lamb. I'm not worthy to tie his shoes. I can baptize you with water, but Christ, will, he's going to consume you with fire. He's going to change the world. Now, he had doubts. Remember John in the prison? Are you the one we're looking for? He had doubts. He proclaimed Christ as the Lamb. The Lamb to span all of eternity. When you look, and as we look in the future about the things that are taking place, the people of Israel, there are going to be four lambs in different situations of sacrifices. And here's the one common thing they had to have they all had to be spotless. No sin. Jesus was spotless. Look at Exodus 12 quickly. The blood shall be assigned for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No plague will befall you to destroy you. Hebrews 9 says, Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. In Leviticus it says, for the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you, for you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. God has said it, He has proclaimed it, and He has fulfilled it in Christ. You don't die because you're covered with Christ. R.C. Sproul tells a story of two books. One book is your book, Empty Pages. It'll grow because on each page will be written every sin you ever do. So it starts off, nothing. But over the course of your life, every page is jotted, every sin, every sin, every sin. I don't know how thick your book is, but Mine's probably Britannica, Encyclopedia Britannica. <laughs> There's some place. You can do a Google search. There it is. <laughs> no. In the other hand is another book, and it's Jesus' book. If you open those pages, they're white as snow. Not one sin. R.C. says, imagine when you come to God and you hold to the book of Christ, then God does not see your book, but sees Jesus' book. Is there any simpler way? Because if you don't have the book of Christ, the covering of Christ, He's reading this book, and no sin can enter into His presence. Christ took our sin that we might have life. And there it is. The last difference is you're consecrated or you're not. When they are cast out and sent out of the world, God says, stop right here. You need to consecrate yourselves. And that meant circumcision for them. Consecrated meant following the covenant that God had established. It means to be set apart. He says to set aside your work He says, set aside your influences. 
19 through 20 in chapter 12, no leaven, no leaven bread, no influence that's going to cause anything wrong, no gods of, the, of Egypt coming out with you. He said, set aside your life. That you're going to remember this Passover forever. And when you do, listen, no foreigner can take it. No hired worker can take it unless they also have been consecrated. Why? And that's why when we do communion every month, if you're not saved, that table's not for you. You're not under the blood. Your door of your heart has not been covered. It's not for you. That's all about the Passover. When we take it every month, that's all about this event, death or deliverance. If you're not delivered, it's not for you. But it can be. It can be. And so there's the question, and we're going to pray. Is, is the door of your heart covered by the cross of Christ? If not... God help you. That's the difference. And when you come out of this bondage, the question is asked here, and God says, are you consecrated to me? Because I'm calling you to be different. You, you will look different to society. You will look different to the culture. You will shine Christ everywhere you go. The, the love of God, the truth of God, the justice of God, the redemption of God, the glory of God, the mercy of God. God help us. The judgment of God. That's why we're evangelists. Because if those people that we love don't have the door of their heart covered by the cross of Christ... It's death, not deliverance. And that's too much for me to handle to think of the people I love not being covered. Let's pray. Lord, from this moment, we move into a time of thinking about the Holy Week and the Passion of Christ for the next couple of weeks in preparation for Resurrection Sunday. And Good Friday, which is the moment of your death, which is the eternal Passover, that your blood became sufficient for all humanity that would come. Lord, I pray for anybody here today that has been maybe in the past walking with you, and now they're way out there. They're that 380 that walked with you and then walked away because it maybe got too hard of all the world's opinions that they don't want to deal with. Would you draw them back today? They have had road signs all along the way saying the bridge is out and avoided it. Just like Egypt had nine plagues and didn't want to deal with it. Let today be the day they say, hey, I need to be covered. My heart needs to be open. Soften my heart, O oh Lord, that I'm with you. Consecrate me, Lord God. Create in me a new heart, Lord. I give myself to you. I give my life to you that I might shine Christ in everybody I meet. Help me. Give me strength. Thank you for the grace. Thank you for the blood that was shed for me. Thank you for covering my sin with your perfect book that I might be saved. Guide me in this life, Lord God, to live a life that's worthy of the gospel of Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, God bless you, everyone. If you were here yesterday,